Hello, everybody. My guest today is Benjamin Ellis. He's worked with companies including Cisco, Juniper Networks uh, during their fastest periods of growth. He's a technologist and serial entrepreneur who's worked at the cutting edge of tech for over three decades and is passionate about what technology can achieve, particularly, particularly at the intersection of people, data, and software. He's now building a company called Social Optic. Benjamin, are you ready to take us to the top? I absolutely am, Nathan. Great right. to be here. Thanks for coming on, man. I appreciate this. Tell me about the company. What do you guys do? And are you a pure play SaaS company? So we are a pure play SaaS company. Uh, and what we do, the clues in the name. So social, it's all about people and people interactions. Optic, it's about transparent measurement. And really what we do is take those measurements and present them back to people to help them make better decisions. Okay. Give me, because when people hear social, they assume like some consultant that doesn't know what they're doing, right? So like, tell me, tell them why you're legit. Okay, sure. I'll be, we had a, a funny time once somebody, uh, we kind of went in and they said, are you here to install the socialist system? It's like, no, 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 no. <laughs> this is not a political thing. Um, it, it's really the fact that the business, you've got the capital, but the biggest asset you've got is the people, right? And what happens in the business is they interact. And that's what social means to us is the interaction of people. My background originally was I was an engineer and then I, I retrained about 10 years ago and did a psychology degree. So I kind of sit on the bound of those two things, looking at, at people and how they interact, kind of like a lot of people would look at a software system. I look at people that way, if that makes sense. Interesting. Okay, so you've got a couple of products, Survey Optic, this before that, Decision Year, Milestone Planner. Are these all serving the same customer base or they're all different cohorts? So they, there is a, there is an overlap and they're all different takes on that, that same theme. So Milestone Planner takes people's goals and presents that back as data. Uh, this, this before that helps people map out the te- dependencies. So it's all about getting things out of people's heads into a, a web-based dashboard where they can look at that and make better quality decisions and interact around it, right? So you can get the whole team to see kind of what's inside your head. And then Survey Optic, which right now is our fastest growing product, um, is, a, is a more general exposure of the platform that's a SaaS product, lets people take any question set and turn that into something that gives you real-time data that you can present in the dashboard. So it could be customer satisfaction, it could be employee engagement, and it kind of drives the, the team then around those metrics. It's in like it. a survey monkey kind of layout, MPS score, things like that. Yeah, kind of. So those tools will focus on collecting the data, and that's great and useful. But what makes data really powerful is being able to present it back to your team in a clear and consistent way. Because if people know that something's going to be measured, that's when it starts to drive behaviors, right? So that's really what we're about, is making people think about what they're saying, get a really accurate map of the territory to make decisions around. So it's it's not just the collecting it. It's really how you utilize that data to make better decisions. Interesting. Okay. So average customer, because I'm sure you have a bunch of different cohorts. I don't want to go down every single one, but on average, what is somebody going to pay to get access to all this? Are we talking a grand a month, 10 grand a month, a million per year? I mean, where are you at? Yeah. So the the, the middle is $1K dollars a month. That's our kind of median. A thousand? Yeah. Okay. And so there's a really big range then because we've got, you know, on one hand, like a you know, small veterinary <laughs> clinic um, and on the other hand, you know, a big pharmaceuticals company. So there's a whole kind of spread of different folks in that. But we, we kind of aim for that one care month medium. OK, makes a lot of sense. And that, that that could be them using any combination of products or any one product. But that's kind of the median. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. We want to talk about more about that later um, in terms of how you drive expansion across multiple product lines. But first, when did you launch the company? What year? Uh, so we, we've actually, the original idea was eight years ago, but we spent a good few years kind of uh, went off and did other things and then came back and realized that this was the kind of uh, one good idea that, that we wanted to put energy behind um, and really built a set of tools that we as a team wish that we'd had when we were founding other companies, if that makes sense. And who's we? How, how many people on the team today? Uh, so the, the the kind of core team is a dozen folks. We've all built and set up our own businesses. So it's a very unusual team, uh, older folks, and and we run the business in a way that's kind of compatible with that. And that's kind of one of our um, our differentiators. Nobody works full time. Everybody works a maximum of four days a week. And we really encourage folks to have other interests outside of the business so that when we're talking to customers and it's mostly kind of CXO level we're talking to, we can have a peer-to-peer conversation with them. So interesting. Just to be clear, it sounds like you guys are your own power users. And because that allows you to get inside your own head, you then spend four days a month basically building these systems, which you all then use to automate your systems and the other stuff you do three days a week. That's exactly it. So we, we kind of break some rules there in terms of kind of building the product that we want, but we realized, you know, it gives us really good customer insight. And then we 
keep that up to date by by making sure that we have in depth conversation with, with customers so, around what they do with that. Be- Benjamin, that's to me that feels like such a smart model, uh, like a really intelligent model. Do all, now, hold on, I'm trying to think about practically how this would work. Do all twelve people have are they all on the cap table? Uh, yes, they are. And that's, wow. Yeah. Kind of employee ownership is is an important thing to to us. That was um, I my early career was in Silicon Valley. I came back to the UK. The UK has taken a while to kind of get hold of that from a tax point of view, but we're kind of there now. So I'm I'm uh, here in London. Um, so yeah, that I, I think that people need to to own the thing that they're behind, so they can bring their their full self to what they're doing. Yeah, and and how many customers have you scaled to today over the past eight years? So through the kind of range of products, it's in the tens of thousands now. And those are different usage levels. Some customers kind of come in and use stuff literally once a year. Others are in every day because of the, the range of different tools. But if we, if we, so instead of looking at kind of historical data, we just take a snapshot of today, like each month, how many people are, would you say are using it? And I'm not talking free plans. I'm just talking paid customers per month. Yeah. So we pay at the, um, the kind of business level, which is separate to the user. So some of our customers might have 10,000 users on the system to kind of give you, give you an idea. So uh, for us, it's less about monthly active users. We're looking at whether each of the companies is engaged. Does that make sense? It makes perfect mm-hmm. sense. Yeah. So how many companies? Yeah. So it, it's in the, the tens of thousands of, and those are, are distributed um, between kind of Europe and the, um, the US and also Australia. So we've tended to, to stick um, to English speaking countries for the most part, although we part of our growth path is, is to do what we do um, kind of more broadly across Europe. Um, but there's some kind of fun and games in Europe, as you're probably aware at the moment around kind of UK's position in Europe. Yeah. So so we're, we're kind of focusing on going in depth in the UK. And then once things are settled, we'll will start to hit Europe a bit more. So, so Benjamin, hold on, help me out here. I think I'm missing something. So you mentioned that you're kind of your average, your mid price point was about a grand per month. And then you just said you had over 10,000 kind of paying customers. That would obviously put your MRR at an astronomical level. Am I, what am I missing up there? So for us, it's a journey of customers going through and you kind of, you talked about customer acquisition. And one of the challenges, as you know, with the SaaS businesses, it's getting increasingly expensive to acquire new users. So we have a model that is, um, it's kind of like a freemium model, but it's really letting people use the tools, get on board with the tools to the point that they realize the value and then turning them into paying customers and then networking from that. So most of our users, you know, because it's B2B, will change company at some point in a you know, 12 to 36 month period. So what we do is we kind of bridge those gaps and that's our customer acquisition model. So it's very organic. It's very slow. It's not AdWords driven and it's purely um, you know, word of mouth effectively through through those customers, and then giving them a way to get the tool in the business, help them realize the value of the tool. So it's a, it's a slow conversion for us from the kind of free users to the paid users. Okay. So which of those two numbers then would you edit? Would you say the thousand dollar average price point is too high, or you're or you're less than ten thousand pay, paying cost paying companies? So we we've basically gone through a transition. So when we started the business, we were kind of down at the you know nine dollars per seat type model, and we realised that that's you know really difficult to scale for the level of engagement that we have with the customers. So over the the last year or two, we're transitioning to to an enterprise model where oh, it so we I have see. A legacy to migrate across. And that gives us a much better cash trajectory than where we were at before. I and see. It's a slower churn level as well, as you know, is is engaging with an organisation as a business to way, way below 5%. Whereas when we were dealing with individual users, as you, as you know, in that space, the churn rates are much higher and, and the costs don't play out. So, so, so well. you said your churn today is less than 5% per month? Yes. So that's we have revenue a kind of or a logo? That's, sorry, that's overall customers. So that is logo churn. What about actually. revenue churn? Um, so that would be in line with that, probably lower because the, the um, if you're churning cheap, if you're churning cheap, if you're churning lower ARPU customers, your revenue churn will be lower than your logo churn. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. Look how that makes sense for the enterprise move. So that, I, I appreciate you kind of explaining that. Um, so would it be more fair than just take that $9 per month kind of model times 10,000? You guys are doing about 90 grand a month, something like that right now. May well be in that region, yeah. <laughs> okay, I just want to understand because those are—I mean—that's the difference between ten million a month and ninety yeah, grand. Yeah, it's, yeah, we're still we're low. And 
you know, part of um, the kind of uh, kind of joy for us is that for all of the founders, we've all done big VC backed businesses. Um, and so this is an opportunity to A, run a business in, in a slightly different way that, that kind of suits with what folks want to do, but also kind of like yourself, it's really good fun because we get to talk to really interesting customers who've got these kind of high scale companies. So yeah. get the fun with, with less of the VCs jumping off their back the whole time. Can you tell <laughs> I enjoy this, by the way? I mean, I feel so blessed every day. I get to talk to founders like 30 every day. It's great. Well, I, yeah. And I think that's, yeah, I, like what you want to do as an entrepreneur, like go out and talk to smart people. It's fun and you learn that way and it's way cheaper to learn from other people's mistakes, totally. which is something we always look at things like. So just, do that and just to be wrong? clear, you, so you guys have, even though you do have VC kind of in your past, you are, you have bootstrapped this. Yeah. So literally when we started searching a lot, it was like, we've, we've all done the VC thing and it's kind of, okay, what could we do with literally the cash in the back, back of our pockets? That's great. Back okay. And, and so what, and that was how we started. As a bootstrapped company, I always appreciate getting getting data points on how fast bootstrapped companies are growing because it's unrealistic to expect 90, 100, 110% year over year growth bootstrapped. And in fact, 30, 40% year over year growth is great for a bootstrapped company. So if you're at call it 90 ish a month today in terms of revenue, where were you exactly a year ago? Oh, like a, a fraction of that. So now we're, and it's kind of good to hear those figures. So we we kind of track for 100% year on year growth. It's kind of what, oh, wow. what we're on, on track for now. So it is, and that was the hardest learning, I think, for me. You know, when you've got VC money, you can you can invest in your marketing, you can grow really fast. When you're bootstrapped, it makes you really focus on like every dollar and everything happens way slower. And I think for the, like the, you know, the, the first year or two of the business, it was like, are we doing something wrong here? And it wasn't until we found other folks who bootstrapped that you realize that you're going to move at a different pace. It's but different. Benjamin, sorry, just to be clear, I mean, if you're going 100% year over year, that means you're doing call it 40, 45 grand exactly a year ago, and you've you've essentially doubled year over year. That's actually really, I mean, that's pretty high growth for a bootstrapped company. Now, obviously, there's our smaller numbers, but that's still healthy growth for bootstrapped. You're making me happy, sir. And I think that's that's one of the things as well as a bootstrap founder like the, the the access to expertise is, is is much lower but it's been a it's been a real kind of learning experience from that point of view that you you know it's it's harder to move stuff yeah uh, are you are you in terms of running the company in terms of strategy are you basically operating it right at break even you're reinvesting exactly everything you make back into the company but nothing more nothing less that's exactly it so putting the money back into the into the growth um which, yeah, again, it's it's interesting how it drives different decisions. It really makes you think about how you're investing every dollar. Not to say I wasn't careful with VC money, um, but you you when you've earned those those dollars, you're you're much more precious around where do we put this that's going to make the maximum impact to the business um, and best support team and best support the customers. Yeah, and you said all twelve of you guys, you're all remote or you all in one spot. Yes. Yeah. And so that was that was an, was another thing of kind of doing an inside out company. Um, you know, I think a lot of VCs are kind of we're only going to invest if everyone's in the same room in the same office. And I understand that now. Um, but actually, you know, as you know, technology is such that kind of where people are doesn't matter. If you trust your team, you don't you don't need them in the same office. Yeah, that's right. And then last economics question here before we wrap up with the famous five, you mentioned kind of CAC as kind of freemium and then kind of land and expand. I mean, when you look at your fully weighted CAC to get a new nine dollar a month kind of seat, is that truly zero or or there's no, there's no there's no cost there? Um, that you know, we still do spend on on marketing, but for the kind of B two B model where we're at, acquiring the, the businesses, it is really really low because it is is word of mouth. Because the other thing we've found is a, a lot of people when they look at at CAC, kind of look at what this thing and marketing. There's also the issue of what do you spend in onboarding that customer. And so one of the things about kind of customer gets customer is the folks who come in are much more up to speed with, with what we're doing and how the tools work. So we don't have to spend so much time with them in terms of onboarding them onto the platform because that's an important part of your CAC, obviously. It's not just the marketing cost. It's what are you spending in support, talking to those folks, getting them up to speed on the course. tools. Yeah. Benjamin, very good. Let's wrap up here with the famous five. Number one, what's your favorite business book? My favorite business book is Five Dysfunctions of a Team by uh, Patrick Lencioni. You've, you've got to build a great team. You've got to make them work really, really well together. I'm trying to, I just read that and I don't know where I set it down. But yes, that was a, I think it's up there. That was a great book. Uh, number two, is there a CEO you're following or studying right now? Yeah, yeah, and it's a familiar name, right? Jeff Bezos, but more because of the way that he communicates things. And I think that's, you know, it's not just about what you've got there. 
That's how you communicate out to, out to folks. And he's a very good communicator. Number two, what billing tool do you guys use? Or number three, sorry. <laughs> what billing tool? Yep. Uh, so, so we use Stripe um, for, for all of our billing and love it. What Do you use any analytics tool on top of that? No, we've built, because effectively a part of what we have is an analytics platform, we use our own dashboards ah. to, to do that and our own AI to do that as well. I see. Number four, how many hours of sleep do you get every night? So um, my kind of minimum uh, pain threshold is four hours. But if I'm learning stuff, then I need more sleep, like 10, 12 hours. If I've, if I've read a whole bunch of books, learned stuff, but otherwise four hours, I'm good. That's crazy low. Okay, what's your situation? Married, single, kids? I am married and I have four kids, which taught me half of what I know. Oh, wow. <laughs> and how old are you, Benjamin? Uh, I am now, uh, I had to think about that, 48. I try not to think about it. I pretend I'm 21 still. Hey, that's good. 21 years young. Uh, last <laughs> question. What do you wish your 20-year-old self knew? Uh, find great people and listen to them really carefully. Guys, find great people, listen to them carefully, has a lot of tech experience, ultimately founded a company called Social Optic back in 2010. They went around a little bit, then found kind of their path. They started off with like a freemium model, call it nine bucks a seat, grew to about 10,000 customers, so call it 90 grand a month, up from 45 grand a month just about a year ago. 100% year over year growth, bootstrapped, which I love. They're now doubling down on kind of an enterprise model. So higher ARPUs, higher ACVs, land and expand approach, team of 12. They only spend four days each on the company. The rest of the time they spend building their own businesses and use Using the tools that they build in the company. It's kind of like having all your customers on your cap table, which is great. They're all remote, less than 3% revenue churn per month. So healthy economics as they look to scale. Totally bootstrap. Benjamin, thanks for taking us to the top. Thank you, sir.